reading through the Bible plan, and it's one that uh, takes you about four chapters or so a day, so that by the end of the year, I will have read through the whole Bible again. It's interesting because it started out in Genesis, and then for this last week, I have been reading this really special book called Job. Job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the book of Job. It's Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. It's right before Psalms. And, and Job, I, you know, we, we talk about Job's friends, right? Job is a man of God. We sometimes talk about his friends and kind of get harsh with them. Um, I'm not sure Job was, Job's friends were thinking that God as a friend was a very good thing for Job. They actually had quite a sense that Job had sinned, he'd blown it, and if he would just stop complaining and admit it, God would set him free from all the bad things that have happened. He's lost his family, he's lost all of his wealth, his, his sons and daughters all killed, um, he's had all kinds of property taken away, and then on top of that, He's gotten boils on his skin. He's sick and skin's coming off. And it's just a nasty time. And the, and, and the best thing of all is his wife loves him so much she just, says, she just says, curse God and die, brother. Get on out of here. And then these friends come. And, and I'd encourage you to read those first uh, 20-some chapters of Job and just kind of listen to what these guys say. Because Job is saying, God, I've honored you. And, and, and he'll make some pretty strong statements about God. God, the wicked suffer, but your people who are righteous shouldn't suffer like this. And, and as he's doing that, and every time he has these wonderful friends who come alongside of him. And you know, at first, I don't think they're that bad. Because frankly, they don't understand. They don't know. And so as they're getting next to Job, they say, you know, Job, you know, you're, you're, you're complaining about God, but maybe you need to look closer to home. Maybe you need to look inside. And it's just interesting going through that this, this week. Because today, what we're talking about is the responsibility we have to encourage one another daily. To get next to one another like Job's friends got next to him. I mean, they were listening to him. They were hearing his complaints and his cries and his statements about God. And having heard that, they then start to respond to him. They're really not that bad, are they? Except <laughs> they're not listening. <laughs> because they've decided already they've determined that Job has sinned and if he'll just stop the sinning, confess to God, life will change. And obviously, that's why all this bad stuff is happening to him. Now, <laughs> the challenging thing with this is that Job's friends don't know that the conversation that God's had with Satan. And it's been an ongoing conversation and Satan is saying, you know, come on. You've been so good, so nice to Job. That's why he worships you. Because you give him everything he wants. He's wealthy. He's got all these wonderful things. Life is so good for him. That's why, that's why he worships you. It's not because he really cares. And Satan is pressuring and having this conversation with, with, with God. Because he really wants to bring down Job. And ultimately, he wants to hurt God. It's interesting because Job also says that Satan goes with the other angels many different times when they report and reports to God. And, he says, and God's asked him, where have you been? It's an interesting story, isn't it? So I encourage you to read it again uh, and kind of look at, look at what's happening spiritually. Look at what's going on in, in Job's life and maybe learn from some of the mistakes that are made as they come alongside of one another. The word says to encourage one another daily. <clears throat> To 
Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Just kind of check it. <laughs> oh, so if I say no, it doesn't do it. <laughs> okay. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from God, but encourage one another daily as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Our mission statement says that we are committed to putting legs to our faith. <coughs> loving God. And we said last week that loving God means also loving one another. The two greatest commandments. And Jesus explains, he says, if you're going to summarize the law, he says, you've got to love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you've got to love one another as you do yourself. Love is the key principle. It begins everything. But that moves us then on to the next part of our statement, which says we are committed to encouraging one another. Next week, we'll talk about growing as Christ's disciples. Fourth Sunday, we'll talk about sharing Christ, sharing Jesus and his love with, with people around us. But today, we have a responsibility to one another, to encourage one another, he says, daily. <clears throat> The word in the Greek for encourage is parakaleo. Now, the reason why that ought to mean, kind of mean something to some of you is the, the word parakaleo is the, word, the root word for what we say paraclete. Now, if you keep thinking about that, the paraclete is whom or what? The paraclete is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says that he's going to go away and, and he's going to send his paraclete, his helper, the comforter, the one who is going to come alongside of us. You see, really, right now, if we believe in Jesus Christ and have accepted him in to live in our life, who's dwelling with us? The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the helper, the Spirit of God that's going to assist us in becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. The, the word parakletos means someone called in to help and to render some service. The Holy Spirit comes to help us. The word parakletos has a great background in the Septuagint where that kind of comfort and consolation distress keeps a man on his feet when he's left to himself. He would collapse. It's, it's the comfort which enables a man to pass the breaking point and not to break. We had a car <laughs> driving up our road the other night. And they spin their wheels because there was ice on the road and not make it. And pretty soon they'd stop. And I happened to be outside with my shovel. So I walked down with the shovel and cleared some, st some of the ice out from under their wheels. And then said, now back up. And had them back down the hill into someone's driveway. And we're going to get a little running start here. And now Go. Well, they started out and they start, got to a spot and they hit their brakes and stopped. Like, no, no, don't stop. Don't stop. So, okay, we're going to have to do this again. And by that time, now the wheels are turned, you know, and all that kind of funny stuff that happens on the ice, right? Yeah. <coughs> we mountain people know how to drive on ice, correct? Yeah, right. <laughs> One of them had their chains out, their cables, as we more lovingly refer to them. And so we put them under the wheels. I also used some of that, some of that ice melt and helped them to get some traction all. Okay, but so back this car up again, back down into the driveway. Now this time, 
I want you to go really fast, and I do not want you to stop till you get up over the hill to the top spot up there, okay? Do not stop. Guess what? She starts out, she puts her gap, starts going forward, and then she stops. Oh, no, don't stop, don't stop. Okay, we're going to do this one more time. Now, this time, do not stop. <laughs> and now I've got my shovel. I'm running beside the car. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't stop, don't stop. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And we got that guy. At one point, I'm pushing the car over on the side on the ice. It's easy to do when you got ice like that, right? I'm pushing it over. So keep going, keep going. Don't stop, don't stop. And we finally got her up over the hill. Now, go home and don't leave. <laughs> The paraclete and paracletos comes alongside of us and helps us to do what we can't do. Pushes us beyond that limit of our ability and gives us the ability to do things that are literally, like for this lady, she was not going to make it up that hill if she kept stopping. <laughs> the word paracletos also is a root for, again, from parakaleo. The, there's a noun called parakalein. And it's this word for exhorting men to noble deeds and high thoughts. It's the word of courage before battle. It's brave heart riding up and back and forth in front of the soldiers that are about to go to battle. And he's giving them this great, wonderful speech that's going to cause them to go out there and die. Right? That's, that's the paracalane that comes alongside and encourages, encourages us even in the darkest, most painful, difficult <laughs> moments. And what does he say? We are to encourage one another daily. Let me give you some more definitions of this word to encourage. To encourage means to call to one's side. Now, men should appreciate this, right? In fact, spouses appreciate this too, don't you? Don't you like to have that person next to you? Draw them in close. But men especially appreciate this. Men like to work side by side rather than talking face to face. Ladies like to have that, oh, let's talk, you know, share our hearts with one another. And <laughs> feel good and all that touchy stuff, right? But men, men like to be shoulder to shoulder. Think about soldiers in, in the battlefield, right? Men like to be shoulder to shoulder. Come on, man, let's, let's take this on together. Come on, Russ, let's fight them out. Sorry about that. <laughs> you got to get tougher, dude. <laughs> Men prefer side to side. In fact, studies have been done. They actually put men in a room, and they had chairs sitting there. When two men came in and sat down next to each other, they shared more than two women did face to face. When the chairs were sitting face to face, the guys said almost nothing. <laughs> but there's this, this sense of being alongside that. And so, by the way, girls, if you want to get close to your man, get beside him when he's working. Okay, don't nag at him from behind. <laughs> okay, but get beside him when he's working. Work alongside with him. I'll tell you, he'll get excited. Because men appreciate that side-to-side -side work. And here's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. Another word for it is to address or speak to, which may be done in the way of exhortation, entreaty, comfort, instruction. There's times we say, come on, keep going, keep going, don't stop, don't stop. That's that, that, that word of exhortation that we give to somebody. It means to admonish. It's to beg or entreat, to strive, to appease, to console. The Holy Spirit comforts us when we are in pain, when we're sad. The Holy Spirit comes next to us. And I'll talk about this later, but let me just make one point here again. That, that to comfort somebody oftentimes doesn't mean you come with words. Remember this. One of the best things you can do to comfort somebody is come alongside them and simply be with them. Too many people say, I don't know what to say when somebody has lost a loved one. When somebody's going through a personal tragedy, what should I say to them? You know what the best answer is? Nothing. It's the question you should be asking is, what should I do? Go be next to them. I'll come back to that in a minute. Well, it'll be a few minutes. 
to encourage one another daily. We need to encourage one another daily. For what purpose? Just because we got to cheer each other up? Because we got to get people up the street that they're sliding down? Is that, is that all it's about? No, it's about so much more than that. To encourage one another daily is so that you do not sin. If you've never been tempted to sin, you probably shouldn't come to church, right? But every single one of us has been tempted to sin. Every single one of us has fallen to sin. Every single one of us makes mistakes and all. And some of us face greater temptation at times. And Hebrews says that we encourage one another daily so we won't fall into sin. The whole purpose of the 12 steps is not really about anonymity, is it? I mean, there's a, a, yes, we say Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Sex Addicts Anonymous, um, the, uh, the various different versions, Drug Addicts an Anonymous. It's all about being anonymous, right? Well, actually, that's not quite true. The anonym, anonymity is lost and it needs to be lost because each person also needs to have what's called a sponsor. A what? A guide. A counselor. A paraclete. Someone who comes alongside of them, who knows what it's like to fight that addiction and sees when they're being tempted to give in and says, come to my house, you're spending the night here and we're going to talk about your battle and we're not going to let you give in to it. That's not anonymous, is it? <laughs> That's very personal and intimate. We need to encourage one another to avoid our hearts getting hardened. And from verse 5, the writer of the Hebrews said, excuse me, 15, as just has been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Yes, Israel had a time where they simply went against God, didn't listen to him, and their hearts got hardened. And that can happen to us. And he says, we need to encourage one another so we avoid our hearts being hardened. The, the word here is sclerosis. Okay, now there's a familiar term also, isn't there? Arterial sclerosis. That's why I have three stints in my heart. Because I had hardening of the arteries. And the plaque was building up inside there. They came blocked and you have to have a stint inside there so you can open up that plaque and then you get to take medicine the rest of your life. And it's supposed to change your diet. And good luck on that one. <laughs> The word sclerosis is about this hardening. I mean, and you see, spiritually, some of us are allowing hardening to develop inside of our hearts towards somebody else, towards God even. In verse 8, the writer of the Hebrews says, Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert. Verse 13, But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And as we've just read, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. John Mar MacArthur has written a book called The Vanishing Conscience. Just think about that title. The Vanishing Conscience. I can remember uh, in the 70s and 80s and there was a whole study that um, on pornography. A presidential um, gr group was organized to evaluate pornography. And one of the challenging things that they said was just that they had to look at some just nasty, wicked stuff. Horrible stuff. But they said the problem is, is that pornography is decide, determined by our culture. What is pornography and what is not. And as our culture continues to change, things that at one time weren't even talked about are now in comic strips and cartoons. Sexual behavior. I mean, how many of you have seen the, 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 the bras and stuff like that on TV? We now get to see Victoria's Secret on TV. Okay, we have moved across a continuum and, and things that were, were sin in the past, we're, it's now around us all the time and so it's no longer a problem. 
MacArthur observed in a chapter entitled, Hardened by the Deceitfulness of Sin, that sin defies and deceives the human conscience and thereby hardens the human heart. God said to Cain, Cain, sin's crouching at the door of your heart. And what did Cain do? He didn't listen to God and went out and killed his brother. MacArthur says, a sin-hardened heart grows ever more susceptible to temptation, pride, and every kind of evil. Unconfessed sin, therefore, becomes a cycle that desensitizes and corrupts the conscience and drags people deeper and deeper into bondage. He goes on. On the cultural level, we can see that as conviction of sin is silenced and the community conscience vanishes, society becomes more corrupt and more tolerant of worse debauchery. The rapid erosion of social standards regarding obscenity and moral propriety provides abundant evidence of this phenomenon. What was shocking and unacceptable only a decade ago is now standard fare on network television. Lewd humor that would have been judged inappropriate outside the locker room not so long ago is now the main attraction in children's entertainment. And things are steadily growing worse. Everything that is vulgar, disrespectful, or illegal, they consider cool. And all that is good or sacred, they ridicule. There's a warning from our text this morning, folks. And the warning is watch out for spiritual insensitivity. And you need to watch out for that in yourself. Beware of becoming hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Tony Evans, in talking about this insensitivity, says insensitivity sets in when Christ stops being real to you and you stop looking to Him for your life. When you stop looking to Christ, unbelief sets in. And when unbelief sets in, you become susceptible to the deceitfulness of sin. Insensitivity means you've lost your ability to feel. How do you know when you're being spiritually insensitive? Sin isn't as painful as it used to be. Before, when you sinned, you were crushed. You had failed your Savior. You had the right attitude about your sin. But when spiritual insensitivity, ins, insensitivity sets in, sin isn't that painful anymore. After all, everybody else is doing it. What hurts? The heart of God doesn't hurt you the way it used to. This is a dangerous condition, which is why the author of Hebrews gives the Holy Spirit's warning, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Stephen Olfer said, the most deadly sins do not leap upon us. They creep up on us. William Sprague said, how insidious is sin. From small and almost imperceptible beginnings, it gradually makes its way until it reduces the whole man to its dominion and brings into cap captivity every affection and faculty of the soul. Sin first throws out the bait of pleasure. Anyone ever felt that? Sin throws out the bait of pleasure. Oh, that might be fun. You won't really die, will you? God's just keeping you from something better, from knowing what He knows. It's a conversation with Eve. Sin throws out the bait of pleasure and flatters its victim onto forbidden ground. Then it makes him the sport of temptation and does not give him over until he is fast bound in the chains of eternal death. Sprague continues, in its very nature, sin is deceitful. Its very element is the region of false appearances and lying promises and fatal snares. When it addresses itself to the unwary youth, it puts on a smiling countenance and makes fair pretensions and takes care to conceal its hideous features until, like a serpent, it has entwined him with its deadly coils and rendered his escape impossible. Watch out, because it's happening all over, isn't it? 
we are becoming insensitive to the sin around us. A question. Who knows you? Who knows you? Who knows the things that put a smile on your face? Who knows the things that, that encourage you? And the way to do that. <laughs> now I can't say no. <laughs> Who knows your weaknesses? Who knows the struggles that you go through? Who knows you well enough to encourage you when you are struggling against Satan and temptation? Who knows you well enough to challenge you to keep cheering Christ with somebody who's been trying to reject Christ? Who knows your burdens well enough to help you carry them? Paul said, carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Whose burdens are you helping to carry? And who will you listen to? Not only who knows you, but who will you listen to? Who can talk to you when you're falling into sin, when you're getting into a bad place? Who can get through to you and you'll listen? Who can speak straight with you and not have to mince words? And you'll hear what they say. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 12. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Some of us have got this high view that we don't need anyone else. We don't need to open up what's going on inside. We don't need to share our weaknesses and our struggles because we can do it ourselves. We even add God to the equation. Oh, God and I can do anything. I don't need anyone else. That's interesting because that's not what God said. In fact, his word is very clear right here, isn't he? He's saying don't have too high of a view of yourself. Instead, let's go on. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body. Listen carefully. And each member belongs to all the others. This is membership in the body of Christ. When we talk about being a member of church, this is what we're talking about. We are members of one another with responsibility for each other. So, and he goes on. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. I look around the room. We're a small group today, aren't we? I look around the room. There's things that are going on in many of your lives. <coughs> Challenges you face. When on a Sunday morning, we look at you and we all say, oh, how come it's so good for them? And I'm going through all this stuff. We say, well, I don't really need to share anything with anyone else. I don't need to tell anybody else what I'm going through. I mean, come on, it's private. It's my issues. 
And in the process, we are missing what God has called us to do for one another. It's the story of the man who, I think I've shared this one with you, who, who was staying away from church because he says, I don't need the church. And the pastor came over and he didn't say much, but sitting in front of the fireplace, he pulled a coal out of the fire, away from the fire, and not, still not saying anything. He just looked and watched as that bright, burning coal started to turn white and gray and black and going to go out. And he got up and left because the pastor had made his point. We say we don't need one another. We are vulnerable to darkness's attack because we think we don't need one another. Our view of ourselves, Romans is saying, is too high. We need to humble ourselves and learn how to encourage one another. And so much more as the day of the Lord approaches. Are you an encourager? You say, well, I don't need I don't need I don't need encouragement. Are you an encourager? Are you a paraclete? Because that's what an encourager is. Are you a person who comes alongside of someone else? At the memorial this week, Rick Warren spoke. And he spoke about his own personal tragedy. Some of you know that Rick Warren had a son who had suffered from mental illness. And I think it's been just three years ago or something like that, he committed suicide. Now, people say all kinds of strange things. And frankly, this is one of the reasons why I would suggest what you say is not the important thing. Because he had people come up to him and say, well, at least you have another son. Really? I just lost this son. And this son is different than that son. And, and, and people, because we're trying to somehow say something special, we, we say hurtful and unkind things. Warren speaking to this crowd of employees at Citizens Arena down in Ontario. And the only people allowed there were people who were employees of San Bernardino County. In the front row were some of the people who were wounded in the shooting. Family members of those who died. Co-workers who were in the room when the shooting, where the shooting took place. Other workers who ran out of the building. I mean, it, these were the people who were there in, in this meeting. Several thousand gathered together. He made Rick said, every one of us needs a group of people who can handle our pain. And then Rick said, the reason why Saddleback Church has become so large, the secret to its growth has been that we have 8,400 small groups throughout Southern California. And 40,000 members of our church meet together in homes to encourage one another, to feel and handle one another's pain. And he said, you all need some group like that that can handle your pain. He did give some instructions. He says, don't try to comfort by comparison. Don't say you know how people feel. In fact, don't even say it to one of your coworkers who went through the exact same thing you did. Because they feel that something different than you feel. You cannot say, I know exactly how you feel. He says, the one thing I would say if you're going to say anything at all, at all, say I'm sorry for your loss. I still remember the day that I was saying something like that to a lady that had just lost a loved one. And she says, I don't want anyone to tell me they're sorry again. Another, another person to tell me they're sorry. You see, 
it, it's, there's probably no real words that can take away someone's pain. And, and the danger is, is that when we give words, we're trying to help them to stop feeling that pain. We're uncomfortable with their pain. And so we want to try to just end it. And we'll even say to somebody who's been grieving for a whole three, well in this case, four weeks, well, aren't you past it yet? <laughs> and what Warren went on to say is there is no end to grief. The grief that those people will experience, and th they will feel for the rest of their lives. In fact, he's made this comment. He says, the deeper the pain, the fewer the words you use. The deeper the pain, the fewer the words you use. Just show up and be there. And then he made this final statement. God never meant for us to handle our struggles alone. For yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. What did we just celebrate in Christmas? That Emmanuel, God with us, came to be with us. God never meant for us to walk through life and its struggles alone. We are better Together, Isn't that what Hebrews is saying? We, we are better together. And it's your false pride that says, I don't need other people. It's something inside of you that you really need to look at. Because if you really are that well off, that you don't need anyone else, then you better be going and giving what you have to the rest of us who are in need. But the problem is, you're not as well off as you think if you're out there alone. That's not what Jesus, what Paul, what the New Testament describes in the body of Jesus Christ. So my question then, as I'm concluding or wrapping up, is are you open to encouragement? Are you open to somebody coming alongside of you and encouraging you? If you're going to be a member of Crestline First Baptist and the body of Christ, then you are going to commit yourself to loving and encouraging one another. I told you there were two speakers, right? Do you remember who the other one was? Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani said, I've been asked to speak at places like this. He spoke at Sandy Hook. And he's spoken at other experiences like this. He says, I've been asked to speak because of the experience I had at 9-11. He says, I lost 10 of my closest friends that day. 10 of my closest friends. One of the men that he mentioned the most was Father Michael Judge. Do you remember who Michael Judge was? He was body bag victim 0001. He was the chaplain of the New York City Fire Department. Giuliani said, Father Michael Judge taught me how to handle death. He shares about the very first death that occurred of a firefighter uh, when he was the new mayor. He was young, new, I didn't know what to do. And Father Judge came and said, we needed to go visit this family. <laughs> the man's just died. We're going to go visit. What, what, I, what am I going to do? He says, he says, Mr. Mayor, you don't need to do anything. You just need to go next to the people and hug them. Don't say anything, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> The lady, the mother of the young man who died was a lady named Mrs. Garumba. 
as they came to share with her that her son had died. She shared that 10 months previously, her father had died. Four months before, previously, her husband had died. And now, her only son had just died. And the family, as they found out about this, started having an argument. Because you see, this young man's uh, sister was supposed to be married in a couple of months. Mrs. Garumba ended the argument because she said that her daughter would be getting married. On September 17th. A week or so later, she came and sent a message to Giuliani and she said, I have no men in my family. Would you come and please walk my daughter down the aisle? I know the, the officer, the chief that was asking him this said, now I know that you're too busy and you probably can't do this, um, but I wanted at least to uh, give you the opportunity and let's share it with you. And he says, oh no, I'm going. And he calls up Mrs. Garumba and tells her that he's going to do that. Mrs. Garumba told, taught Giuliani these, this. She said, life gives you good things and bad things. Don't forget the good things because of the bad things. Celebrate the good things. Learn how to laugh and cry on the same day. And if we don't, we're not going to survive. That was her statement to the mayor when he said, how can you do this? Because my family needs to laugh and cry on the same day. Because my family going through all this pain needs to also remember the good things and the good times. <clears throat> September 17th was the wedding. But September 11th came before that. The mayor almost lost his life. I don't know if some of you know that. He actually went in with a group of his friends and leaders and all, and they got trapped for a while, and they almost died. On Thursday, a call came from Mrs. Grumba saying, I know you probably can't make it because you're too busy. Giuliani says, my wife was standing there listening as we got the call. And she said, you're going. And, I, and he said, I wouldn't miss it. Because he said, I learned that when life gives you good and bad, that in the bad times you need to remember the good. And we needed that time of celebration together to encourage one another. Are you open to encouragement? And are you willing to be an encourager? And are you willing to accept encouragement? And I warn you, it's pride. It's a hard heart. It's giving into temptation that will keep us from letting somebody come alongside of us. How can we pray for you today? We haven't taken the offering yet because we wanted to give you the opportunity to share your prayer needs now. You've got the tear off right there. It's an easy thing to do, isn't it? But what it takes for you to share personally on that prayer request is it takes some humility on your part and a willingness to be vulnerable and to be open to somebody else. It's the same thing and this is why either we're too busy or we just don't think we need anyone else or they don't need us and so we don't connect with one another in our life groups. Are, are we, is, it, is it fear that keeps us from that? Is it just our busy schedule? 
What is it that keeps us from coming alongside of and encouraging someone else? Today, we want to pray for you. But we don't know how to pray for you unless you tell us. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes before we do anything else for you to take that tear off and for you to write down how we can pray for you. If you want it to be confidential, then mark the box on the top, confidential. If you're not going to write anything down, would you pray right now about who you can share with? Who knows you well enough to come alongside you and encourage you? Who knows you well enough to come alongside of you and help you not to fall into sin? Who knows you well enough to celebrate and rejoice when you are celebrating and knows you well enough to cry with you when you are crying. Will you share with this family so we can pray for you? This is your time. God, you love us so much. You didn't leave Job alone, although his friends thought that he had done wrong. You love us so much, God. that you've given us all the tools and the resources we need to be able to handle even the difficult things in life. You've taught us this blessing and responsibility to love one another and to love you. 
you've equipped us, God, to encourage one another, to come alongside of each other and to give that hug or to run by that car and say, don't stop. You have called us to the blessings that come for us when we do that, <clears throat> when we open up, when we become transparent, when we allow people to see in. And Lord, we need that help so that we won't give in to the hardening of our hearts, to sin's deceitfulness. We need it so that we won't give up. Lord, help us to encourage one another and to begin doing this as your word commands us to do it daily. Lord, we need help to get to know each other so we can do just that. Now, God, as we give you these requests, we believe that you will meet them according to your riches and glory. And we believe that you care about us. In Jesus' name, amen.